Hi, everybody. Hope you are all well. I just hit record, so 90% of my job is done for the evening. Um, thanks so much for rocking up. And um, I'd like to firstly say that I am calling in from um, Boonarong country. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional owners of the lands which I grew up on. Um, and have enjoyed many, many years of my life. And hopefully going forward, I'll be able to not only enjoy them, but also work hard to be a custodian of these lands as well, um, alongside that, uh, that, you know, respect for the traditional owners and hopefully creating greater awareness about their presence and how they've been able to look after these lands for tens of thousands of years. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to uh the great Bo Miles um actually he's not he's he's just Mr Bo Miles I actually I think he's Dr Bo Miles I think I'm getting yeah he's Dr Bo well, let's go with Dr Bo Miles hey Dr Bo Miles how are you I, I think I'm unmuted yeah hello mate yeah nice to be here uh bit of a frog in the throat bit of a it's not COVID I'm, I'm assured uh yeah in a cabin just like just like uh Madge not yes. quite as not quite as sunroomish as Hillary. It's pissing down rain where I am, but it's very pleasant. <laughs> well, Bo, um, look, mate, we are going to thanks so much for your time, mate. Um, we know you're a busy man, father of a young uh, young girl, May, and you know you are continuously working, shoveling horse poo and all of that jazz. Um, now, look, mate, we are going to watch your film called Run the Line. <laughs> And then we're going to come back around and we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A with you. But could you just firstly introduce the film a little bit to us? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's one of my favourites in that, you know, they say you shouldn't have favourites with your creative projects or your kids, but you kind of do. You know, you have, your, you have your inkling on things. It's a lovely project because it's very close to home. It's an unexpected, I suppose, successful story. I thought it would be a filler you know, on my YouTube channel. And I'm, not, I'm certainly not a prolific filmmaker or prolific anything, but uh, I thought this was probably going to be a filler, just a nice little bubbling film with a bit of running action in it and a few old pictures of trains. But it ended up being a really sweet story about um, how you map yourself against the landscape, similar to what you said in your opening thing. Um, and, and it's because it is so close to home, it is the most, it's the easiest place to take for granted. And we, we know all this. We know that we take what is close to home for granted. But you often don't reflect on it and, until you film yourself going through those lands and then you sit in an edit suite for a couple of weeks, really churning over what the point of this story was. And so it ended up being a really, I, I think, a sweet story of being really happy at home because for 20 years before that, I just wanted to be somewhere else. And so, it, you know, it's kind of a lightning bolt film or a moment for me where I'm super happy here. Uh, I'm, I'm on this little five acre joint up here in Jindavik and I couldn't be more content in this whole, even this whole lockdown bonanza. It's, 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 it's Eden. It's remarkable. I think that sort of translates in the film. Um, as a run, it was hard too because I did some stupid things. I, I wore clothing that was sort of weird 1950s get up and, uh, and took bad food along. And it was a hot day and redheads don't like running in, in the heat. It was an unseasonal hot day. <laughs> but anyway, the films, I, I think the film's kind of neat and um, it, it's quite authentic and it's, and it's very personal to me. And I, some of you have probably seen it already, but um, I suppose if you have seen it already, look for bits look look for bits that you haven't seen before if, if there's such a thing or if that's possible and for the rest of you i hope you enjoy it and i look forward to your questions awesome mate can i can i ask just two more questions what was what's the best bit of uh best compliment you've received about the film and what's the the piece of advice or compliment that you wish you never heard about the film well i was accosted so the, 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 the film is about running an old railway line that was closed down here in the 50s my dad remembers it. My grandparents remember it. I certainly don't. I've always seen it as just a disused railway line, but uh, it's about 40 odd, 43, 44 kilometers in length. And at about the 12K mark when I was running it, all privately owned now, 
And fair enough too, uh, a woman came barreling up in her car and accosted me. And it was kind of a, a set of bad taste of a tone for the trip. Um, for, for, and she had every right to come and accost me. Uh, but, but I still didn't expect it in a sense. So that was kind of a bit disappointing. But this, this was a finalist at Banff last year. And a lot of, a lot of people uh, enjoyed the film. It was very Australian. It was very um, real, authentic vulnerable i suppose you'd say because i was at the whim of police and landowners and of course i couldn't get permission of all of these landowners before i'd gone because i just wouldn't have got it which means the trip wouldn't have been possible so you have to kind of be edgy a bit and risk being a fox in a foreign land and um you know you kind of got to wear that and i did so uh yeah they're sort of two insights <laughs> nice mate wear it i bet you did with style hey so if everyone looks in the chat the chat there is a link to bo miles's youtube channel and the film itself so what we're going to do is ask people just to click on that link and watch it organically through your own channel right it's going to go for just under 24 minutes that way you're going to have the best experience of the film it's going to be much nicer. It's just going to flow better because we've all sat on Zoom meetings and just sat through a jittery replay of a film, which is quite frankly, not what we want to do here when we're, we've got an opportunity to watch Bo Miles beautifully flowing through the, the blackberries of um, Southeast Gippsland, um, which I don't know if it's Southeast Gippsland, so Bo. But um, so if you can click on that link, um, watch the film 24 minutes and then we're going to leave this chat open and um, and like we'll uh, come back and have a bit of a Q&A with Bo afterwards. Um, take your notebook, take your pens, get some notes. Remember, this is Dr. Bo Miles. He's going to be super pissed off if you have no notes, no questions or anything like that. Um, that's what he told me before the call. So uh, rock and roll. Enjoy the film and we'll meet you back here in about 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. what, what, I, what I might do is I might just make this semi-formal for about two seconds and then totally informal. But I have had the pleasure of speaking to Bo a lot um, and asked him many, many questions many times before. Um, but so I'm going to try and be as quiet as possible and allow everyone else to have this opportunity to ask Bo questions because um, unlike you, I have his phone number. And the real beauty of this is for, yeah, people to be able to have this opportunity to connect with Bo and ask him questions about the life of life and all sorts of other things. So um, please, if you've got anything that you'd like to ask Bo, Let's, uh, let's just roll with it. You can put your hand up in the chat and we can try and organize it like that or just just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't make this be awkwardly silent either because I will be really annoyed. So we'll both, uh, we'll get pregnant, pregnant pauses are perfectly okay. We can just gather our thoughts and you can, you know, 30 seconds is perfectly okay. Then I'll just start talking. So um, <laughs> get in before I do. Uh, well, I'm gonna, I've got a question for you both. Um, Excellent. I really like your movie. Like, you know, I just saw that's almost reached 2 million views, which is pretty amazing. And it's about a train line that no one's ever heard of. But I guess, you know, 2 million people have watched it and, you know, probably enjoyed it. And it shows the, the power of storytelling. And I think at the moment, like, even though that's like a microcosm of the world, it's, you know, people relate to it in their own way. But like, I don't know, when you're, you know, choosing what you make movies about, do you just, obviously it's important to you and do you assume that if you tell a story that's important to you, that will then people will find their own value in it? Or do you kind of look for the bigger messages or do they kind of come out in, in the wash as you kind of make it and tell that story? Yeah, so, so what, to, what to tell a story on and what to not. Uh, the instinct and the premise of any, if, if anything makes it to the start line of a shoot, right? Because for every 10 ideas I have, I probably shoot one and I put them all in this working document and I vet them with my wife and my production partner because there's a lot of kooky ideas in there and some of them just fall flat. But if it makes it to the point where we're going to shoot it, it's got to be something I really, I'm really gen, and I mean genuinely curious on. And that means listening to yourself and not thinking, are other people going to think this is a good story? I, I never, ever consider that. I think, am I going to be engaged? 
And then I have to trust myself with it and engage with it. So I very much give myself to the project. I really do. Um, I think a lot of people do, right? But they'll often, I've, I've seen this and I used to do it myself. So I know I, people will often tell the story uh, or do things uh, or go through a life of a career based on an assumption that they think that's what people want them to do or they think they should be saying a particular thing. Now, if you get that, if you get rid of all that, it's the most, not only is it the most liberating thing in the world, but people really appreciate the authenticity of what's going on in that moment because you don't have to remember a thing. You're just, you're just filtering the world and you're using your tools of text and, and language and your body. Uh, you're just throwing everything out, out at this story. Now, the second layer to that, Hillary, is um, that you have to really respect your audience. And so I think one of the artfulness or the art of storytelling is to, is to get to the chase and to leave in the best bits. You have to create the essences of what took place. And that is often really hard. Some films are really easy to make. A Mile an Hour, which is my most successful idea, and I never would have thought it was. I thought that was another stunt film. Uh, was made in like three weeks and it was pretty easy to make because there were just lots of little moments that had a little shine to them. And so you end up with this really nice product. Whereas other films are really hard. The Human Being, that's the hardest film I've ever had to make because I didn't go anywhere. There was no lineal story to it. It was very internal, I suppose, literally. And so that was really hard to make. Um, so, yeah, I just aim to, I aim to be authentic because that's the easiest way. You never have to remember anything and to respect your audience and to get to the point um, with, while, while showing some insight or hoping to. Yeah. Yeah, nice one. Um, and as well, do you ever, in every film, everything you do, do you have that moment where you're like, why did I sign up for this shit? <laughs> um, not always. And if I do, I, I swiftly remind myself that you, you cook this up. So I can tell you about a whole bunch of films that are coming up. So I'll give you the, I'll give you the word. So the, and I, this is genuine, right? Because I've said this every year, I think, for 10 years. When I do, go through a project, I say that is the hardest thing I've ever done. Well, my, a film that's going to come out around Christmas time is called A Tree a Minute. And I planted a tree a minute on this, on this old farm that was hilly and boggy. I planted 1,440 trees in 21 and a bit hours and tried to rest the other three hours and didn't, just laying there in the mud. And the, it was so hard. It was so hard. And at about the 15-hour mark, I thought, you know, I'm strong and ambitious and a bit stupid, but I thought this is just nuts. And I had, I had, to, I had to break from, you know, I had some sort of stupid idea. I'd only eat licorice for the whole thing. And so I... I had a big thing of coffee and just got on with the job. And yeah, it took me um, three minutes more than I should have. It took 24 hours and three minutes to, to do. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I, I kind of regretted that at about a 10 hour mark, but just had to make it work. <laughs> Who's coming on? Uh, I don't know how, is it Salome? You say your name, what a great name. And Jesse and Eleanor and Scotty and Neil and Liam. Come on, team. Yeah, Hillary's got my number too. We can talk after this. Let's come on, what's going on? I've come all the way from Jindavik, you know. I've been in the car for hours. <laughs> I have a question if someone's going to jump in. Go for it, Alice. Um, so from watching your videos on YouTube and reading the book, I get the idea that you're super inquisitive about the world and how it works and about people too. Was being that curious about things something that's always come naturally to you or did you actively train your brain to think about things and wonder why yeah the latter Alice so I was an underwhelming kid I'm probably still an underwhelming 20 year old and I had to um I had some really good mentors that showed up and uh it was I don't know, I was probably 25, 28. Oh, look, no, that's not true. I've always liked my own space. And when you like your own space, you're quite happy with inanimate relationships, like a tree, even though that's somewhat animate, or, or a billy cart or a bike or a mountainside or a rock or whatever, right? I, I quite like the company of non-human things. 
but then that can that can just fall on deaf ears that just means you're probably pretty weird right and so the next step of that was to articulate why i like that and to search out maybe stories within it because that makes you then a social person and so I think that probably happened in my kind of late twenties where I was, I thought oh, I like storytelling. I love filmmaking, but I'm not very good at it just yet. How do I get good at it? Or how do I find my point of difference? And it was joining the dots with those two things. I like the world, but that now why, why do I like it? Why am I curious about it? Um, you know, I'm now looking over the most magnificent of views and I'll just show you there. I'm not sure if that came through, but it's, it's over a paddock, almost looking over Western Port with undulations and mountains off into the distance. There are so many curiosities in my view. It's kind of, it's kind of staggering. Um, so then you just have to trust yourself as to follow those leads and try and articulate that, um, which I sort of talked about earlier. Articulating what makes you curious is often really hard. So uh, that's what I'm training myself at. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate your answer. <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Quick question from my cousin Tim here. G'day, cousin Tim. G'day, bro. Yeah, um, long time watcher, first time caller. And, uh, <laughs> Good on you. Um, uh, I guess quickly, uh, uh, a very important question. What's your favourite type of bean? And then a, a less important question. Um, how would you sort of describe the balance between how you do what you do? Is it primarily like an, an ego motivation you want to do like a hedonistic sort of thing you want to do things that please you that that are that are fun for you or you feel a sort of duty to do something that you think has a pretty big impact and is going to influence others i've never what it, what was your name again sorry mate i was writing notes tim. tim sorry tim um chickpeas i love chickpeas i love yeah, chickpeas because people don't think they're beans and it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a fun fact there uh, I, I love chickpeas and I'm not sick of any bean. Let's put that out there too. I still eat lots of beans. I make stories. Um, I was, I had a really good response for your second question. Uh, it was about why I make stories, right? Was it something like that? It's sort of like the balance between like, is it for you like hedonistic or is it because ah. you uh... Yes. I remember. Yes. And you said something about, do you try and inspire people or whatnot, or do you try and sort of tap into some larger themes? Um, no, never have. It, it, it's happened organically that way. And I'm, I must admit, I'm a bit miffed and chuffed and, and really, um, I'm really kind of honoured, I suppose, when people say they're, they're inspired by me running around my block and, and doing a whole bunch of jobs. You know, holy shit, I think what, I, just, I just tried to make a weird film and, it, and, it, and that's taken off. That's been copied all over the world and, and charities are running in every country for it or lots of countries. It's remarkable, right? But I think, I think in many respects, it's like an indie band that never wants to get big. I kind of, I kind of, they're really authentic with their music. They just want to make great music and keep their mates happy. I'm a bit like that in that I just, I just want to tell stories. And, and if they go big and go beyond Gippsland or Jindivik or Australia, then awesome. But I never meant that, meant it that way. Uh, and yet I do want, I, I am very ambitious with numbers on YouTube. I think if I'm going to be a YouTube, I want to play the game and I want, I want these things to be seen by as many people as possible, but that doesn't mean inspiring. And that just means paying me, you know, a 10th of a cent to watch it and being pretty happy at the end of it. Yeah. That's the idea. <laughs> Good question, mate. Thanks. Cheers. What's the longest you've run in one day? How many like kilometers or miles? Oh, not far, really. I mean, talking to the madges of the world and probably yourself, Kate. Um, oh, 75, 80. Uh, I got lost and blew up. And yeah. The, but I suppose the hardest, I mean, I ran, I ran 707 kilometers in 13 and a half days for the Alps. And that averages over 50 Ks a day on that sort of terrain. I'll I'll never match that again, I don't think. I think my body would fall apart to do that again. But I've what was big... the? I was just going to say with that Alps trip, what was the prettiest terrain that you hit? Like there's some beautiful ridge lines there, yeah. Totally, but the uh, thing with beauty is that beauty is often matched with the sentience of yourself when you're seeing these things, and so in many respects, the the most beautiful places were when I was feeling like I could accept that beautiful view, <laughs> because for a lot of that 14 days, Kate was a real. 
unfortunately, it was a very much a time distance blur. Um, I will always pay attention to the views on the crosscut saw uh, up around the Viking and Mount Howard because it is, it's a special place. I've been there when I wasn't in a rush. So that place is remarkable. Arguably one of my favourite places in the world. So, yes, I, I knew of the beauty when I scrambled across that. But there were moments within that that uh, uh, are quite undescribable to an audience because they're quite, um, they're very intense and very personal. But yeah, that's a cracker. That was remarkable. The cross cut, yeah. Um, now who, I think. Yeah, I had a bottom. question for you. Yeah, Jody, go for it. All right. So um, I'm curious, did you start exploring your backyard because of the COVID restrictions or was it something else? No, it was, um, I suppose I've been critiqued a bit in the past about this concept of backyard adventuring because it's not my concept, of course. It's just me getting off on being a, a late 30s, 40-year-old and trying to cram a lot of these sort of adventurous ideas into, uh, into and around work <laughs> and family and everything else. And they're critiquing me on saying, Bo, you've gone off and had all these global experiences. And so you've got this sort of layer of uh, adventure ideology that can be tried. You can try and match it with a sense of perception in your own backyard. And if you, if you say to others, hey, look, there's this great thing out there called backyard adventuring or this concept of exploring locally. And yet these people haven't been globally to make counterpoints for themselves, then you know, it's kind of an unfounded idea in some respects because it can't, it's not a one match. It, it can't fit for everyone, right? So to answer your question, uh, I did a lot of global travel on a shoestring for a lot of years. My stepmom was with Qantas. Actually, she still is. So I paid ridiculously. I had cheap flights. I'd fly to India for 97 bucks, you know, and I went, to, I went to London once for seven hours and flew home just because I wanted a date with a girl. It was remarkable. So I was super lucky to travel the world for no money um, and do wacky things. And so I'm now knowing that um, I, I can kind of repeat those things at home because I have these touchstones. But I also do realise that the, our sense of perception is remarkable and I want to exploit it. The fact that humans... Uh, are so enamored and we know about the placebo effect. Well, if we know about it, let's, you know, you'd be crazy not to exploit it because you get more bang for your buck. And uh, I love that concept of doing more in less space. Yeah. There's a long winded answer for that. <laughs> Sorry, Jody. No, that was great. I'm curious though, how does Australia and your backyard stack up in comparison to your international experiences? Um, Look, I suppose I, I travelled extensively as a young bloke to go and uh, meet people that weren't Australians. Uh, they were often cultures that were so much more exotic, but they were always more difficult generally, in a good way often. Australia, to travel in, a tr in Australia and Australians in general, we're just, we're wonderful people really. And it's, um, we're so big and it's so less populous compared to the, the rest of the world. It's a pretty good place to now find myself as a backyard adventurer because golly, um, yeah, it, it's staggering. Think of the state of Victoria and our, I live, I live right between the sea and the mountains and, and I, on a good August day, I can surf in the morning, have a picnic with the family for lunch and then be skiing in the afternoon in the twilight. I mean, that's, it's just so, so amazing, remarkable geography. Yeah. Not that I do that, I'm, uh, I, but I've, made, I've been meaning to do that for 20 years and I still haven't done it yet. <laughs> I keep telling myself it's a good idea. Hey, Bo, there's a question here from Lisa and she says um, she'd love to hear a little about how your life and philosophy of adventure is informing the way you are bringing up your little girl. Yeah, May is very much... she. And we all say it, all, all parents say it, we shift our worldview pretty quickly as soon as May came along. And, and it was good. It was very timely because my ego is um, very in check with my ego, but I know that it drives humans to be a particular kind of person and do things. As soon as she came along, I knew that I had another purpose and that was to just be a good dad and to just show her a great life and, and 
resilience and uh, diversity and good food and whatever. Um, I, I can't wait to do more long range things with her, but even just a little walk with May uh, in the bush and for her to say, oh, I've got my, I've got my sandwich and I've got my, my shoes and my, I've got my hat. I mean, I, I, you know, it's just cool when your little, a little two-year-old becomes your best mate off it for a bushwalk. Yeah. It's reinvented how I see the world uh, and what I do uh, slowed me down on some things as well, which is just great. I think that was Kate. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, that was Lisa. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Yeah, sorry, you nice. <laughs> Jesse, you better ask a question. You've been laughing and doing all sorts of things. You better say something. Scotty, Eleanor, Matilda, and family. If the whole family can ask a question. Hey, hey, Tim. Got a question. Um, I guess, Bo, you. It seems like a lot of your adventures. You're um traveling around solo. Is that always sort of an intentional? um like an intention from the start or is it just worked out logistically easier that way um and i guess how how has that sort of changed your adventures and um sort of always having to rely on yourself in all those situations you end up in the good and the bad yeah yeah good question jesse i i i, I don't know where that came from but i liked you know i'm i was pretty scared of the sea when i started to become a sea kayaker and that's in, in, indeed why I became a sea kayaker because I wanted to be challenged by this very unnatural space for me. Uh, I really like the accountability of solo travel. I love it. I love the space that it allows. And we all like, you know, Jesse, if I was to share my playlist of my favourite songs with you, you'd probably be able to listen to some or all, but they wouldn't be your playlist. Uh, and like music, self-travel is just the most beautiful thing that you can do for yourself in, for, in terms of your cadence to run and walk and paddle and journey across the world at your own pace, at your own whims is the most indulgent magic thing. It is remarkable. I love it. Um, and so I'll always squeeze in these solo trips. So I, I kind of make films that same way now. I love the accountability of Bo being able to produce a story out of something that is often mundane. Now that's bloody hard to, and I now have really good collaborators. So it's about being Bo when he has to be and to get that sense of yourself and then collaborate with someone you really trust to pull it to the surface. And I have that now. And it's really nice. So I suppose Helen and the family is one form of that. And then my filmmaking buddies are the other. But yeah, the, the deep yearning to be alone, I'm not sure where that comes from. Um, maybe sort of a fractious household as a kid where, you know, parents were screaming at each other and you just wanted to get the hell out of there and go and chop wood or go for a run. And, and there was maybe a bit of that if I was to um, psychoanalyze young Bo. <laughs> yeah. Good question, Jesse. Yeah. Yeah. Go. But I was wondering what your funnest film for you or adventure, even if it's not a film so far has been, that's been the funnest to make or do for you? I yeah, it's a great question in that um, I think it sometimes changes depending on the edit because most of my story comes from post-production. So I, I dump the idea on film with a whole bunch of people and then I see what, I see what the best bits were. And, and I'm, essentially my films are a series of mini stories the best little bits and then you stitch them together to make a, a something. Um, the most underrated film, I think it's, it's only had a couple hundred thousand views is junk paddle. When I made my paddle out of junk stuff and I mostly shot that myself. And I think it's a lovely, sweet little film. And I loved it. I, I loved shooting it. I loved making it. It, would, it came together. I thought pretty well. Uh, and yet it's, it's just not very, it's not a sexy film idea compared to some others. Cause it's just a plain off paddle people think it's a paddle making film and well it kind of is but it was a fun one so i thought that was pretty good do you know what i haven't told I i've done another mile an hour i did it last week i ran around my paddock here 51 times over the course of 24 hours and renovated a canoe an entire canoe from this banged up old crap canoe that was going to get thrown out to this resplendent beauty and it was almost as hard as the tree planting bonanza. And it was, it was, it wasn't really fun. I wouldn't say Matilda, but it was really satisfying. <laughs> it was, and, it, and I think it's going to be a great film because yeah, it was, it was full on. It was really cool. <laughs> Epic. Look forward to seeing it. Thanks, Bo. Good on you, mate.
Oh, there's Paige. Paige, you're under someone else's thing. Scotty it's Dad, Paige. sorry. Dad's laptop. <laughs> Good on you, Dad. Where are you? <laughs> Good on you, mate. Nice to see you. You too. What's your next event? What are you going to go and beat the world at next? No, you, next... If no one knows, this girl, she's one of the best runners in Australia. It's, it's, she's awesome. <laughs> Um, no, I'll go down to the roller coaster run in the Dandenongs at the end of November Brilliant. with the guys from Buffalo Stampede. Yeah. Fantastic. I'll see you there. I might be there on the microphone. Oh, awesome. See what happens, <laughs> Even mate. better. Good on you, Paige. Thanks, Bo. <laughs> hey, um, how are we going, Time? I would have gone and cooked dinner for my two-year-old and my wife. So I'm happy to stick around for another five or eight minutes. So keep the questions flowing. If you haven't, if you hadn't uh, asked anything. Go for it. I'm, I'm open for business here in my wife's uh, office. Um, I feel like I'm hogging it a bit, Bo, but you mentioned before that you, is it um, Mile and Hour is now raising money for charities overseas? Is that? Yeah, so the, uh, is it the WWF or is that wrestling? The World Wildlife Fund. <laughs> I always get them mixed up. And I've actually said that in meetings. You guys should really change your, your, um, your uh, logo. Um, yeah, so the, the World Wildlife Fund, they've got it in, in the UK. They run it across various places. And, um, and there's been some smaller ones too where just little villages or towns have done it. And they've just, they've, they've opened up a few streets and said, right, oh, what needs to be done? And let's all run around the block for 12 hours or 24 hours and do each other's jobs with our skill sets. And I thought that is just so cool that people are fixing each other's fences and running around the block. And a lot of uh, college students in the US have, have copied it. <laughs> and they're doing all these sorts of, yeah, jump on YouTube. There's heaps, there's heaps and heaps of all these people doing a mile an hour. It's great. That's awesome. That's, yeah, what a great idea. Tim's making up something that's special there. That's, that looks good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask Hillary, what, what, what's being prepared in the background there? Um, <laughs> what are we making? What are you making, Morgan? Tart, tart, tart. Tart, tart, Apple pie, apple tart for dessert. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they didn't want to miss out. So we've got the move the kitchen out so we can all <laughs> listen to Bo's wise words. Oh, this is good. These are not wise words, folks. These are just whatever's whatever's front of mind. <laughs> That's great. I started my next book, my next book yesterday. That's exciting. You folks are the first to hear about that. Uh, don't tell anyone about my pregnant wife either. I just realized I haven't told anyone about that yet either. So <laughs> don't tell anyone. <laughs> Only at 11 or 12 weeks or something. Um, <laughs> Eleanor, have you got anything to say, mate? Do you want to? Uh, you don't. You certainly don't have to. I just thought I'll say hi because I'll see your face there. Okay, I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, good, mate. I I don't have any questions. Well, it's nice to meet you. I like your t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> From wild places. And Salome, is that how you say your name? Uh, Salome. Salome. Oh, beautiful. Yes, that's me. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't have any questions, but uh, yeah, I was super inspired by by your adventure there. It was yeah, it was great, and I'm. Looking forward to looking at your other videos as well. Yeah, you can binge watch for the next day or two. You'd yes. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, I just had my jabs. So that'll be a good, a good thing. To do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, as the sickness creeps in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> good on you, mate. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Hey, Bo, um, I think Salome, Salome, what did you do at Tekina, Tekina this year, Tekina Trail? You do, you well, ran the, the... Yeah, I ran behind uh, Paige there. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. You were right up front. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> That's fantastic. Close. Well, I was dead last. I mean, my, <laughs> my excuse was I was the sweep for the race, but even so, that was so slow. <laughs> I've never been that oh, slow was, before in my life. Yeah. It was so much fun, though. Good on you, wasn't it? Wasn't it spectacular? <laughs> Good on you, mate. Well, if, uh, if, uh, any last questions, team? Send them through. Otherwise, um, I'll go down and make some pizzas. I think it's pizza night tonight. Uh, it's been nice being up here. I haven't been up to the to Helen's workplace for the last few days. So, um, well, weeks actually. I don't think I've been up here. Spider webs all over the joint. Anything else from you folks out there? Any other insights I can give you from the film in terms of what about filmmaking ideas or any budding filmmakers there or? 
I don't know, people who want to try and tell a story or write a book, is there anything burning a hole in your pocket? I was wondering, do you get all the archival footage before or after you actually do the, do the run? Uh, a bit of both. So if I come across a bit, of, a bit the same with songs. So I now have about 100 scripted ideas on this big working document. And because I, I sort of, whenever I'm going through art list where I get all my music from, an online portal of music, I'm screening for music the whole time because it takes forever to find a soundtrack now. Um, I'll think of an idea or I'll hear a song and I think, right, I know what shot that can go to in the future. So I do that with music. And I suppose the same if I just come across images or maps or ideas that I think might, might retrofit. But otherwise I get how I make films. Here's a, here's a big fat insight. And this has taken me 20 years to get. We shoot the heck out of the film now and I always wear a, a microphone. So poor old Mitch, my, my production man, he, he has to wade through 12 hours, 15 or 20 hours of bow a day uh, for the wave file and we just chop it. We go back to the edit suite and then we create the film off the best of Bo's voice. It always has to be driven from the best voice and not just Bo's voice from Hillary's in the background saying something or Madge or whoever. And then we create a film around it. And I never did it that way. I didn't, I did it the other way around for 10 years, but voice is key and good voice. And, and you get yourself that narrative. Yeah. Oh, I've got one last question, if that's all right. Go Matilda. Did Let's you go. ever find your uh, personal, did anyone ever find that beacon you lost on We Are you know, Close? Do you know what? So unfortunately, right, I have, um, in a mile an hour, I put my address on my letterbox. <laughs> so I was on Google a few months ago as being a tourist attraction, like on, on a map that's global. And so we've had to get that removed. I'm a total idiot, right? And I can't get rid of it in the film now. But so, yeah, we put I lost this beacon during a filming of um, a film that's going to come out next year. And we put it out there, as Matilda was saying, on social, uh, social media. <laughs> and these tough guys went out to, to look for it. These they came third in the world's toughest race. Like they're totally outdoor buffed units. You know, they can run 100 Ks and go forever with no sleep. And they didn't find it. They came back and said, no, Bo, it's not there, mate. It's, it's gone. And then this beginning bushwalker um, amazingly followed it up, didn't, didn't ask if it had been found. And she found it two weeks ago and just rocked up on my doorstep with my, my beacon that I'd lost seven months ago. <laughs> so I got a knock at the door. Yeah, so it was awesome. So I gave her a bottle of wine and said, you're, you're ace. And I was so chuffed that she'd found it exactly where we said it was. And these three guys who are red hot just couldn't find it. It was a really nice story. Well, thanks everyone. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna uh, shoot through. But um, yeah, I, I'm available online really easily. You can just go through to my website, and and that email just goes direct to me. Uh, so yeah, I'm. I, I smash out emails all day. So if you have anything to follow up with, by all means. Nice to see your faces, and thanks for coming along, and thanks for watching the film. <laughs> thanks so much, Bo. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, we really Bo. appreciate it, mate. I hope the pizzas are good and say hi to Helen and May for us all. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing what's coming out soon, mate. Yeah, thanks, folks. Um, there was supposed to be a film out this Wednesday, but that's been railroaded and will be pushed back at least a, a week or if not a month. So I made this. I'll never, ever do it again. I said I'd make 14 films in 14 months. And so far, I think there's only been seven out seven or eight, uh, and I've only got two months to get the rest out. And we, we were on task. We were on task to give you another six films or seven films in the next two and a half months. But I think we just got derailed. But there will be an, at least two to three films out between now and Christmas and lots more early next year because of it. So there'll be a backlog. But, yeah, heaps more coming. So thanks for watching, team. Awesome, mate. Thanks so much, Bo. Have a great night. Good on you, folks. Thank you.